Hello, this is the second part of mandible. In this video, we are going to discuss the muscles attached to the mandible, development of the mandible, the age changes of mandible, as well as the clinical and forensic significance of mandible. Muscle attached to the body of the mandible are as follows. Just above the mental tubercle is the incisive fossa. To this shallow incisive fossa, mentalis muscle is attached. To the posterior end of the oblique line are attached depressor labii inferioris and depressor anguli oris muscles. The platysma is attached just to the bone below them. Just below the alveolar border, buccinator muscle has a linear attachment. This is the buccinator muscle having a linear attachment. Extending medially behind the third molar to the terigo mandibular raft. Adjoining this alveolar border, the bone is covered in buccal mucosa. Now, muscles attached to the internal surface of the body of the mandible is as follows. To the mylohyoid line, mylohyoid muscle is attached. This is the mylohyoid line and this is the mylohyoid muscle attachment. Just behind the third molar is superior constrictor of pharynx and sometimes the detromolar fiber of maxillator are attached. Here the superior pharyngeal constrictor, buccinator and pterygomandibular raft are jointly attached by mandibular periosteum by a joint tendon. As discussed in the last video, to the upper genial tubercles or mental spines, the genioglossus and to the lower genial tubercle or mental spine the geniohyoid muscle is attached. To the diagastric fossa is attached the anterior belly of diagastric muscle. Here it is important to note that the lingual nerve reaches the tongue just above the mylohyoid line closely related to the bone in its posterior part. Often a shallow groove is related to the lingual nerve in this part of the bone. Now coming to the attachment of muscles of the ramus as well as the coronoid and the condylar process. Much of the lateral surface of the ramus gives attachment to masseter. Much of the lateral surface of ramus gives attachment to masseter. Except posteromedially where it is covered by parotid gland. The medial surface of the ramus gives attachment to the medial pterygoid muscle, to the roughened area, posterior inferior to the mylohyoid groove. This is the roughened area for medial pterygoid muscle, just posterior inferior to the mylohyoid groove. Lingula gives attachment to the sphenomandibular ligament. This is the lingula, which is a extended triangular bony projection just overlying the mandibular foramen. To this lingula, the sphenomandibular ligament is attached. The mylohyoid vessels and nerves pass through this mylohyoid groove. As we have already discussed, the inferior alveolar nerve and vessels enter through, the, enter through this mandibular foramen pass downwards and anteriorly emerging through the mental foramen as mental nerves and vessels. Now the lowest fibers of the temporalis muscle descend beyond coronoid process to the anterior border of the ramus. So the temporalis muscle lowest fibers are attached here from the coronoid process to the anterior border of the ramus. It is important to note that the mandibular incisure or notch, which is this concavity, is transmitted the mesenteric nerves and vessels from the infratemporal fossa. So the mesenteric nerves and vessels, they are transmitted through this mandibular notch, which is a concavity on the upper border of the ramus of the mandible. Now coming to the attachment of the neck of the contyler process, On the lateral aspect of the neck, the temporomandibular ligament is attached. Here the temporomandibular ligament is attached which is covered by the parotid gland. 
Anteriorly on the neck, there is a pterygoid fovea, which gives attachment to the lateral pterygoid muscle. While the medial aspect of the neck is related to the auriculotemporal nerve above and the maxillary artery below. So, the medial aspect of the neck of the condylar process is related to the auriculotemporal nerve above and the maxillary artery below. Here we would like to give a brief review of the muscles of mastication. So the masseter, the temporalis, medial pterygoid and the lateral pterygoid muscles which are not visible in this section. The medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid, masseter and temporalis. These are the primary muscles of mastication. The four primary muscles of mastication being the masseter, temporalis, medial pterygoid, lateral pterygoid. The primary muscle of mastication, which is the strongest one, is the masseter muscle. Here we will briefly discuss the origin, insertion, action, as well as the nerve and vessel supply of these muscles. We can say that the masseter, temporalis, medial pterygoid, and lateral pterygoid are supplied by the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. And the common arterial supply is the maxillary artery. Coming to masseter, the origin of the masseter is from the zygomatic arch. Insertion is on the lateral surface of the ramus of the mandible. Its action is elevation of the mandible and protrusion. The nerve supply is mandibular division of trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth cranial nerve. The temporalis muscle, its origin is from the temporal fossa. Insertion is on the coronoid process of mandible. Its action is the same, which is Elevation of the mandible and protrusion and it is supplied by the deep temporal nerve which is again the a branch of mandibular division of trigeminal nerve. In this cross section we can see the medial and the lateral pterygoids. This is the lateral pterygoid having a upper head and a lower head and this is the medial pterygoid. Coming to the medial pterygoid, the medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate of sphenoid gives origin to the medial pterygoid while its insertion is on the medial ram surface of the ramus of mandible. We have seen the roughened area on the medial surface of the ramus of mandible just posterior inferior to the mylohyoid groove. The action of uh, medial pterygoid is the same which is elevation and protrusion of the mandible and it supplies by the main trunk of the mandibular nerve. The mandibular nerve is one of the three divisions of the trigeminal or fifth cranial nerve. Now coming to the lateral pterygoid, the upper head originates from the greater wing of sphenoid, while the lower head originates from lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid. The insertion is on the pterygoid fovea, as we have seen on the anterior surface of the condylar process of the ramus of the mandible. Now action is, it is the sole depressor of the mandible. It is important to note that lateral pterygoid muscle is the sole depressor of the mandible. So it is the only muscle which is responsible for the opening of the mouth during mastication as well as the sideways movement of the mandible. The nerve supply is again from the mandibular nerve which is the branch of the trigeminal nerve. So we can say that the four primary muscles of mastication are masseter, temporalis, medial pterygoid and lateral pterygoid. Out of these four primary muscles, the medial pterygoid, temporalis and masseter, they are the elevator of the mandible and the protruders of the mandible. Well, the lateral pterygoid is the only muscle which is uh, the sole depressor of the mandible as well as uh, used for the sideways movement. That is the opening of the mouth depends upon the lateral pterygoid during mastication. The other muscles which are the mylohyoid muscle, the buccinator muscle, the geniohyoid and the genioglossus muscles are called the accessory muscles of mastication which will be discussed later. Coming to the development of mandible, it develops as a bone that ossifies over time from left and right pieces of cartilage or Meckel's cartilage. These cartilages form the cartilaginous bar of mandibular arch. It is from the proximal part of this cartilage that malleus and incus also develop, which are the two ear ossicles. 
the intramembranous ossification begins by about 6th week of fetal life as we know most of the flat bones of the body have intramembranous ossification each half of the bone develops from a single ossification center that appear near the mental foramen accessory nuclei that appear are one for the condylite process extending backwards towards the ramus another for the coronoid process and its anterior part and a smaller nuclei in front of both alveolar wall these nuclei later get absorbed so at birth mandible consists of two parts united in the center by symphysis menti later getting ossified after birth by about 1 to 2 years of age this is the picture showing the age related changes of mandible at birth in adult age and later in old life so at birth the body of the mandible is a mere shell containing sockets of two incisors a canine and two deciduous molar teeth the angle of the mandible is nearly obtuse somewhat 175 degree and the coronoid process projects above the condylar process this coronoid process is projected above the condylar process by about 4th year of age the angle becomes somewhat less to about 140 degree in young adults the angle of the jaw becomes lesser somewhere between 110 to 120 degrees the ramus almost becomes vertical in direction and the condylar process it is higher than the coronoid process also the mandibular notch gets deeper in old age the mandible becomes greatly reduced mostly due to the loss of teeth and consequent resorption of the alveolar process and the interalveolar septa the angle of the mandible again becomes wider in older age somewhere to 140 degree and the condylar process becomes backward bent Coming to the clinical condition, the mandibular fracture usually presents a twin fracture on both sides. The most commonly related clinical condition to the mandible is presents as a locking of jaw. Patient usually comes in the outpatient department with inability to close the mouth, and a hyperextension at temporal mandibular joint can be seen. Sudden violence or a forceful contraction of the muscle. even during a convulsive yawn usually results in this condition reason being one or both of the condyles is displayed suddenly in the infant temporal fossa reduction involves depressing the mandible posteriorly and at the same time lifting the chin the second common condition seen is the derangement of the disc of temporal mandibular joint which presents as pain and clicking sound on closing the mouth It occurs due to the overclosure of the mouth or trauma, resulting in the backward displacement of the condylar process, thereby deranging the disc of temporal mandibular joint. It can also occur in post-operative patient during intubation. The forensic significance is that in homicidal cases where skeletal remains are available, mandible is used for the determination of the gender as well as age determination of the victim. So this was all about mandible in the next video we will be discussing the temporal mandibular joint thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and share